If you've ever wanted to hear from the CEO of a top, fast-growing self-storage company, then you, my friend, are in luck. Because today's guest is Chris Harris. He is the CEO of Store Space Self Storage, the former CEO of iStorage. If you've been around the storage industry for the last 10 years or so, then you are very familiar with that name. So uh, in this episode, we jump into his background a bit, uh, markets, acquisition criteria, how they source deals, and what it's like to be a CEO. Stick around to the very end. You'll hear his answers to the best deal, worst deal, and recommended business book. So without further delay, here is Chris. And uh, he didn't do the video, so if you're watching this on YouTube, uh, you'll just see kind of a blank screen for Chris's uh, face. But don't worry, he is on there nonetheless. That's it. Let's get right into it. All right, everybody, I have Chris Harris, the CEO of Store Space Self Storage. Chris, thank you so much uh, for being on the show. I really appreciate you taking the time. Uh, I kind of want to jump right Absolutely. in and talk. Yeah, yeah, I want to jump right in, talk about your background, and then get into some very good, meaty stuff with the time that we have remaining. So, uh, Chris, if you kind of kick it off and let us know a little bit about your background, how you got into self storage, and uh, what you're currently doing. Sure. So background, I was originally in banking before I got into self-storage, uh, you know, did a lot of construction lending, mostly West Coast, Arizona, California, Nevada, all different product types, you know, a lot of residential master plan developments, uh, medical construction, you know, hotels, you name it. Uh, Great Recession hit. Bank got shut down by the FDIC, learned a lot of lessons working partly for the new bank buyer as well as the FDIC on doing troubled, uh, troubled loan sales. So really interesting experience from that point and where I ended up getting into self-storage was we were looking for an asset class we could consistently lend on that most people didn't know or understand. And so that led me to self-storage and I said, I'm going to learn this you know, particular niche and I'm going to you know, make sure I have some of the biggest names out there as customers and I'll, I'll grow my book that way. Uh, so did a lot of self-storage lending, loved the asset class, loved everything about it and uh, ended up having one of my clients uh, who I financed who started buying in 2010 uh, self-storage, former, former multifamily guy. Uh, he asked me to come on board and help him run finance and acquisitions for him and Thought it was a great time and it was a great opportunity and so uh, moved across the country started with that and then that led into uh, you know it turning into you know what is known today as ice storage uh, went from finance and acquisition to taking over as president and overseeing the build out of all the in-house management and infrastructure and technology uh, and then from there uh, became the CEO of the company that's amazing man so that's that's interesting. To back up for a second, uh, where you said you were working at the bank and you guys were looking for an asset class to lend on that most people didn't know about. Besides the self storage stuff, uh, what else did you guys like? What was second and third choice? You know, in that list, because I think that's kind of interesting for people to uh, hear. Yeah, it was mobile home parks was another option. Uh, that was kind of part of that that asset class, and then specialty medical was another one that I jumped into. Things like long term acute care hospitals and uh, and I was just trying to find that that unique product type where there was a very defined customer segment and then you know more importantly when you look at banks and when we were managing things back then we were one of the few groups that were actually you know lending or had capital to lend and as a result you know we were highly scrutinized by the regulators they kept you know stratifying the portfolio into you know you can only have this much exposure in retail you can only have this much exposure in office and geographic limitations and all of that. So uh, the one area where there was always room was self-storage. And that so that, that's kind of how it, it went in that direction. Yeah, that's so interesting. Uh, I, I'm sure that it's burned in people's minds, you know, that time period and everything that was going on if you were around during that time. I was in residential real estate at the time and it was just really, uh, that was brutal. But um, reflecting back on the commercial side, that's so interesting. So the SBA started lending on self-storage and now it's grown into I mean, we fast forward the clock quite a ways and it's grown into what it is. It's kind of this, um, you know, looking big uh, monster in the room, I guess, that some people are jumping into now and other folks, have, uh, you know, are kind of, you know, trying to figure it out still. So anyway, okay, so now we're here with store space, self-storage. You guys have been on a tear recently in this last, I don't know, six, eight months or so, uh, acquiring properties in Philadelphia, Texas, Georgia, expanding the portfolio. I think that's so cool. How do you guys determine what markets 
you want to be in? Is it kind of a, um, you're familiar with areas already, or is it kind of like, let's take a map and research demographics, et cetera, and then go that way? How do you guys uh, figure that out? Yeah, so we're, we're kind of taking a different approach than most people take in that, you know, in this environment, especially if you're trying to give value add like returns, uh, most people are in development. And it's a lot easier to pick and choose where you want to be in development as you just kind of figure out, you know, what land site has the right metrics and then, you know, can you tie it up for the right basis. Using an existing acquisition strategy, uh, it's very hard to just say, I want to be in these geographies and that's all we're going to buy in. So how we did it last time at iStorage, how we're doing it now at, at StoreSpace is kind of the same. You're, you're a little bit of chasing the deal and you're using... Uh, let's say macro market principles for what would determine whether or not you want to be there. You know, we look at the, all the normal things, density, supply, new construction. Um, and then also, you know, is there some sort of institutional REIT presence already in that market so that we know we have a decent exit opportunity when we decide to sell? Interesting. So you want to make sure that there's a REIT or at least be confident that someone may come in or something like that, but you want to have a fair level of confidence that REITs are going to like the market you're picking because that's where you're kind of thinking of exiting to if you want to exit. Is that right? Yeah, that, absolutely. I mean, right now we're in a really weird spot in the, in the market where private equity has kind of overtaken, uh, you know, the REITs and their, their acquisition and their buying opportunity. I don't know if that's a, a long-term or sustainable, uh, you know, capital source to, to be that aggressive. And so I view it as, you know, especially a couple of years ago, you know, the REITs were the more aggressive buyers and, and, you know, that kind of puts a gold stamp on any particular market if they have a presence there. And so that that's kind of how we're looking at it. That's interesting. That kind of goes back to what you were saying earlier, how some folks are jumping in. So now you see private equity getting uh, more involved in the space, buying the larger uh, deals uh, and kind of taking the place of the REITs. So that's kind of speaking to that, I think. That's really interesting. Um, so if you're looking for acquisitions, okay, what what is your... Uh, what types of deals make sense to do you guys? Well, first off, let me back up. Sorry. Do you guys do development or is it all acquisition right now? It's pretty rare for us to do development. We'll do some redevelopment, but it's just, it, it's, it's a long time to wait for, you know, a decent yield. I mean, we always look at it as 12 months entitlement, 12 months construction, three years stabilization. And at this point in the real estate cycle, you know, to wait five years to get that return and not know what, you know, let's say the other side of a recession looks like pretty hard to find deals that pencil to that level of risk. Interesting. Okay. So mostly acquisitions of existing, you mentioned earlier on that you're doing value add. Uh, so is it, are you looking for deals where you can purchase and expand? Uh, where are you getting the value add uh, side of things from if you're looking at an acquisition uh, type play? Sure. So it is everything from you know, smaller facilities that maybe aren't of institutional size, but have expansion land that you can get up and, and get to that, you know, more, let's say, efficient square footage where it makes sense for an institutional group. That's one avenue. Reconfigurations, if you have a poor unit mix, really high, uh, you know, average unit size, your rent per foot is going to be extremely low. So you can do reconfigurations if the building layout is right. Uh, that's been an area where we've seen some success. Uh, the typical operational inefficiencies are what we always look for. You know, people who don't have a strong online marketing platform, don't have revenue management, aren't offering tenant insurance or tenant warranty. Th those are all the things where there's kind of built-in upside if, if we find that. It's, I'd say it's really hard to take an institutionally managed, stabilized deal and make any money at it. So that's why we... Uh, that's why we like to to go after those value add type of type of opportunities. Yeah, that makes that makes complete sense. And brokers, I, I interviewed a few brokers here recently, and they they watch and they just want to know, okay, what are they looking for? Because they can send you guys deals, and at the end, we'll obviously have uh, ability. You're a, give you an opportunity to share the information uh, so they can reach out to you guys. But how do you guys source deals? Is it primarily through brokers, or is it? Uh, I've done in the personally, I've done in the past, like letters, phone calls directly to owners. Uh, you know, that sort of thing, tracking people down. It can take a lot of time to do that, but I uh, found success in that route. How do you guys typically source uh, these deals that you guys are doing? So this is a relationship business and, and your reputation will get you very far. Uh, we've always just had a strong reputation of being able to close, of not retrading people. And so 
brokers have come to us and will give us usually first crack at deals or, you know, try and help us, you know, position it where we're, we're able to ultimately win the bid. And that's, you know, because they know that it's actually going to happen. And if they get, you know, if they tie up the deal with us, there's not going to be those awkward later conversations of, okay, he found X, Y, and Z and he, uh, you know, he needs a million dollar haircut. So the relationship side of the business has been absolutely crucial. Um, you know, the other thing I'll say on just the cold calling owners, I think a while ago, let's say four or five years ago, off market deals were something that had major opportunities and were great buys. Uh, today, everybody just, there's so much publicity about self storage, how aggressive buyers are, where cap rates are, um, and there's no real stress triggers yet that create that person who wants to do that quiet sale. They're willing to take a haircut, but, uh, you know, don't want it to be public knowledge. You don't really see that very much anymore. The, the typical off market deal is I don't want to sell, but if you'll give me a five cap, I'm a, I'm a seller. And so it, rather than spend a lot of time going through those, we'll let brokers do what they do best and weed out who the real sellers are from the people who, you know, are just willing to accept a, a crazy offer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's really good. So leveraging the folks out there who are boots on the ground, um, bringing the deals to you guys and the reputation, knowing that when you underwrite it, the numbers are going to be accurate or at least very close to accurate. And uh, there's not going to be some hiccup along the way that comes from uh, the numbers, the, the deal, the offer, et cetera. So I think that's great. That's a great strategy. Um, and it makes a lot of sense what you're saying as far as uh, owners who want to sell quietly. You're right. Like, the cat's out of the bag and uh, everybody kind of knows, at least if you've been in the business or doing research, you can get information online uh, from a number of sources and know that pricing is pretty high right now or expectations, at least on seller side, are pretty high. So, all right, that's, that's very good. Uh, let's get into real quick um, management, technology, that sort of thing, because you guys recently announced uh, July 1st, I think it was, or right around there, um, that you guys are now offering third-party management services. Um, what is that? Obviously, we know what third-party management is, but what is that? How do you guys differentiate yourself uh, from others out there who, who do the same or something similar uh, for owners? How do you guys make it different for them? So I'd say, you know, our, our primary competitors in that space are the REITs. They, you know, have a massive third-party management division. And where, where we are able to, you know, provide something a little different is our approach isn't just a giant black box algorithmic you know approach and hopefully you're on the good half of the average wins versus the bottom half uh you know i know a lot of people who've gone that route and they don't have a lot of discretion can't change uh you know and if the strategy for how they want to fill it doesn't work they don't have a lot of options and so where we differentiate is we are constantly we're a testing culture and we want to make sure we can achieve and hit what somebody's pro forma is. And we will continue to test every way possible we can from changing marketing, from revenue management strategies to uh, you name it, in order to ensure that we you know, get the best performance out of that particular asset. And so it's a much more customized approach uh, to third party management to ensure that you know, everybody's goals are aligned and ensure that the owners are getting the type of return they expect out of the asset. Hmm, that's really interesting. And you mentioned uh, you guys also have um, technology and that. So let's talk about that for a second. Where do you see, you've been around this industry for a while um, and you've seen all the new gadgets and different things that have come out and uh, algorithms, et cetera, as you just mentioned. Where do you think technology is heading toward uh, in self-storage? And let me, let me back up for a second because you have the larger players out there, the Jefferson Shreves of the world, the Red Dot Storages of the world, uh, the 10 Federals of the world who do things on a completely unmanned or pretty close to it uh, basis. And then you have folks who aren't willing to do that. They want to always have somebody in the store or at least have a store that's large enough that you can support a very good property manager on-site management company. Um, where do you see technology going? Do you see it kind of splitting between the those types of owners or do you see um, maybe a happy medium with the, with the technology that's out, of, out there right now? So I, I do think the kiosk model is something that will become more and more uh, prevalent in the market, but I don't see the personless store being really a uh, feasible structure for the masses. In order for that to work, you have to be very densely clustered because, you know, as we all know from running and operating these stores, you still got to do your walks, you got to do your overlocks, you got to have somebody present that's sweeping out and cleaning up units. And 
you know, to not have someone hired to do that, it's really tough to main, you know, to manage your store unless if you have, you know, 10, 15 in a market and you can have one, uh, you know, regional, basically repair and maintenance and cleanup person who just roves across multiple properties. So I think the kiosk model becomes a hybrid version where maybe you have a payroll light type structure mm -hmm. um, rather than a, you know, two FTEs or an FTE and a part-time you end up with just one FTE and a kiosk and the kiosk manages, you know, all of your payment functions. If somebody's comfortable with it, like people who check themselves out in a supermarket, mm -hmm. uh, they'll go, and they'll do their own rental following, you know, using the kiosk and not have to have any human interaction. But the second somebody has got a problem, they want to talk to a person and that's yeah. what having that person there helps, helps yeah. uh, address. And so I think, that piece of the business, I see it becoming more prevalent, but not in the way that I think, uh, you know, other people think it will. I, I don't see us going to a totally personless store model. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. It's it, the differences of opinion that I get on that is uh, really interesting. So thank you for sharing that. Let's talk about being a CEO for a minute. And uh, what, what is your kind of day to day look like? You're obviously trying to grow the company. Um, what is, well, let's back up for a second. What's the what's the end? What's the strategy right now for store space, and how are you guys uh, working to get there? So the strategy is continue to acquire assets, build up a larger portfolio, um, and ultimately we want this to be our long term hold. You know, we had no intention of selling i storage. We just couldn't say no to the offer. Um, we want to be in this business for the next you know twenty years. So the intention isn't build up, you know, 10, 20, 30 assets and then flip it out and sell. Tension is, you know, build ourselves into a larger, sustainable, one of the more profitable private, you know, holding companies that that's here to stay. So first uh, order of business is we need to regrow our platform and our, you know, ultimately our footprint large enough to where we get all the efficiencies we used to have at kind of 50 plus stores. And so that's why you've seen some some pretty aggressive expansion from us on the number of deals that we're buying, the markets that we're in, so that we you know, can race to get to that scale so that that efficiency hits faster and we're not having to subsidize it at the management company. Hmm. That's very good. What is the, uh, for you as a CEO, what is the day-to-day -day like and what sort of tasks or I guess topics or whatever are the most important for you to get done uh, every day? Yeah, so with where we're at as a company right now, we're still in the very early stages. So it's not a compartmentalized structure yet. Everybody's wearing multiple hats. I'm wearing multiple hats. My day revolves around, you know, acquisitions, financing, and equity primarily. Um, and that's both the sourcing of kind of friends and family capital as well as institutional capital. Uh, so that, that makes up the bulk of my day to day. Um, and ensuring that the growth and the acquisitions that we're doing meet our strategy, that we're safe, and ultimately we can weather any type of storm that comes our way in the next couple of years. Um, as we continue to grow, get bigger, you know, that, that role becomes much more of kind of strategy, supervisory, just overseeing, making sure our equity partners are happy, investor relations. Um, but right now, it's, it's a little bit of everything. Right now, it's a very entrepreneurial uh, get your hands dirty and, and get out there and grow the thing, right? Exactly. Yeah, that's exactly. great, man. Uh, let's get to the final three questions. Chris, I appreciate you being on, man. I want to run through the, these are the same three questions that I ask, uh, I've started actually asking every guest, uh, just to add a little color to their background and, and their experience. So what is the uh, worst deal that you've done? It doesn't have to be the absolute worst, but just, you know, maybe a, a deal fell through, a lot of due diligence time was spent, you know, stuff like that. What, what would you say is one of the worst deals you've done and what did you learn from it? Uh, is that, uh, does that have to be in self storage? Uh, no, it doesn't actually. All right. The worst deal I did is we started a oil field service business, uh, about three, four years ago, uh, which was supposed to be servicing the Marcellus shale. And the whole thesis was, you know, looking at similar to what we did with storage, when the market is terrible, that's the time where you buy and force, you gain your market share, and then as the market you know recovers and comes back, everything is very profitable. Yep. Took the same approach. This is right after oil crashed. Uh, people were going out of business left and right, and we jumped in with the idea of we're going to gain market share, and then as the market comes back, 
you know, margins improve and things come back. Well, we gained market share. We were one of the largest operators in the market. We had a significant, uh, you know, operation and, you know, a lot of employees, but margins never returned. <laughs> oh my there was a structural change in how the, how the fracking business worked and what the service side of it was able to charge, you know, because there wasn't a hundred dollar barrel of oil and you know, still to this day, it's not there. It's not. It uh, just tanked so pricing, the other day again. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Pr pricing never came back. And, uh, you know, unfortunately we had to shutter the division because it just, you couldn't wow. make money and wow. not with the, not with the size of operation. So wow. that was uh, that was the worst deal I ever did. <laughs> but you, yeah, okay, hands down the worst I think I've heard so far. But but, uh, but you said something, very <laughs> and it's because uh, I mean that'd be pretty tough. We built the whole company, our whole division, and we had to close it down because because of what you said, the structural change in the industry. So I think that was obviously the risk there, and I think we can all. I love reading about different types of biases and how we fall into those types of traps, and it's interesting to see, uh, you know that happen and so you being real realizing there's always trade-offs there's always risks and sometimes it's hard to see where those things lie even though even though they might be right in front of you so that's a great that's a great story man great lesson uh what is the best deal you've done doesn't have to be storage uh but best deal uh, that you've done it's probably the pension fund recap we did with i storage um we had about 14 mini funds prior to doing that you know, anywhere from two assets to 10 assets in each one of those funds. Uh, friends and family structure, different waterfalls in every one of them. It became an absolute nightmare from an accounting standpoint and just an administration to oversee that, that type of structure. Uh, so we, uh, we ended up with a direct relationship with a pension fund. They did a recapitalization of the entire portfolio uh, from basically the parent level down it was an entity buy-in. We had to do a uh, debt assumptions on the three CMBS loans that we had, get them to buy off on the new ownership structure. And in doing so, we were able to retain 25% of the ownership in the company, pension funded 75. And our cash flow as owners actually stayed the same, even though our ownership percentage declined. So wow. it, was a, it was a solid deal, great partner. Uh, great transaction. Wow. That was that was supposed to be our twenty year money. Yeah, yeah, that's incredible, man. Because I'm sure it was a wow. If you have that many, I don't know how many investors you guys had in iStorage, storage, but I'm sure it was a good number. And to recapitalize that whole thing and jump through all those hoops, how long did that take to do? About four months. Really? Okay. So that's that. That was shorter than I expected. But still, wonderful. That's amazing. So I think this, the lesson there is obviously if you can have one main investor uh, that's favorable to you, then that's great. But obviously, it doesn't always work that way. And it's probably pretty rare that it works out that way. But um, uh, And last, the last question, what's one or maybe two uh, recommended business books that you've read or that you've listened to on Audible? So I'd say Scaling Up by Vern Harnish. That's uh, that's one where I've, I've read that, loved that, you know, and very timely for you know building a business from scratch and all the things you got to keep together and keep organized in order to you know ensure you're you're building up the business properly. I'm making I'm taking notes because I like to look these things up afterwards. So I have the video obviously, but I always, always want to go look it up right away. Awesome, man! So scaling up um, lessons on building a business, scaling that business. I think I want to read that book. So um, I think that's it for now, Chris. I really appreciate you coming on, man. Chris Harris, everybody, the CEO of Store Space Self Storage. Chris, how can folks uh, reach out to you if they either want to maybe sell their facility or inquire about third-party management services? Yeah, so they can reach out to me uh, by email. Email is chris at storespace.com, S-T-O-R-E-S-P-A-C-E.com. And uh, I will respond quickly or put you in front of the uh, right person on our team to make sure it's dressed. Awesome. Thank you, Chris. Appreciate it, man. Thank you so much uh, for taking the time and uh, we will talk soon. Fantastic. Thank you. All right.
All right, that was Chris Harris, the CEO of Store Space Self Storage. Reach out to him if you have any, uh, if you have a deal that you want to sell or have any questions about third party management services that they are now offering. Store Space Self Storage, Chris Harris, CEO. Thanks, guys, for watching. I'm Chris with the Storage Investor Show. If you have any questions or comments, please reach out. I do read everything. Thank you guys so much for stopping by and spending some time with me and our guest today. I'll talk to you soon.